Market to Market is everywhere you are. Subscribe to Market to Market on YouTube, find us on the PBS video app to stream on demand, and add our three podcasts on your favorite podcasting app. Coming up on Market to Market, Secretary Vilsack answers questions on chemicals and CRP, sorting out ports and global demand issues in Ukraine. The cost to repair after the flooding is gone. You know, where we're really at is the corn market after the and July And market analysis report. with Don Rose, it, uh, we're sitting around next. 514, 544. What's the most complex industry on Earth? It's not genetics, or meteorology, or logistics. It's a business that involves them all. It's farming. Thank you, farmers, from Pioneer. Tomorrow, for over 100 years, We've worked to help our customers be ready for tomorrow. Trust in tomorrow. Information is available from a Grinnell Mutual agent today. This is the Friday, May 27 edition of Market to Market, the weekly journal of rural America. Hello, I'm Paul Yeager. The home may be where the heart is, but new units are foreseeing more ache in the pocketbook. Sales of new homes fell 16.6% in April. Economists cite rising costs of the new units as construction expenses have driven the median price up 21% in a year's time. Now, rising interest rates also played a part in the new sale decline. Orders for durable goods went up last month eight-tenths of a percent. The orders at factories for longer-lasting items rebounded from a drop in March. The new preferred measure of inflation, the PCE, was up three-tenths of a percent in April and 6.3 percent in year-over-year measurement. Inflation was also on the mind of U.S. Senators in the Agricultural Committee hearing this week with USDA Secretary Tom Vilsack. So, too, were comments reminiscent from the Nixon-era Ag Secretary Earl Butts. John Torpy has more from Capitol Hill. Well, the challenge would be for American agriculture to innovate. Uh, USDA Secretary to to Tom Vilsack was on Capitol Hill this week to answer a myriad of questions from the Senate Agriculture Committee. Top of mind for committee members was USDA's response to the threat of a global grain crisis. I appreciate the announcement from the USDA made this morning that will allow some additional flexibilities for those with expiring CRP contracts. While Bozeman celebrated the action, he urged USDA to take a step further to ensure an increase of acres for planting. One suggestion is look to the past. In the 2014 Farm Bill, landowners enrolled in the Conservation Reserve Program were given an opportunity to end their contracts early without penalty. We should give serious consideration to this, to this penalty-free incentive again until grain production returns to normal. I believe this flexibility would allow potentially millions of acres to return to food production. The world cannot afford for prime farmland to lie fallow. Under a rule change announced Thursday, participants in the last year of their Conservation Reserve Program agreement won't have to wait until October 1st to begin farming the CRP ground. We're basically suggesting that they can now voluntarily terminate without penalty for those roles that are now coming, or those acres that are now coming out of the program so that they'd be in a position to, to do work now. The one-time rule change is aimed at increasing plantable acres, one of the ways the agency is addressing the forecasted world grain shortage. Some committee members voiced concern over the use of the herbicide glyphosate, which some see as a needed tool on grain farming operations. The U.S. Department of Justice recently took a new unprecedented position on glyphosate that could cripple the effective use of this very important ag product that we count on. If our farmers cannot use safe, common sense, and effective products, what would happen to U.S. crop yields? We have to continue to look for ways in which we can invest in and encourage additional research and development. Uh, on a wide variety of, of initiatives, including crop protection. Uh, we need to continue to work with our, our industry to make sure that innovation uh, is, in, that we invest in innovation. For Market to Market, I'm John Torpy. 
The Biden administration announced this week the establishment of the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework for Prosperity. The White House is looking to stabilize trade and supply chain issues disrupted by COVID-19 and more recently Russia's invasion of Ukraine. World economic leaders met this week in Davos for the annual meeting and shared similar topics on their agenda. Those in the impacted areas are telling of the urgency of the current situation from the field. Peter Tubbs reports. As the Russian invasion of Ukraine drags on, observers are concerned about the availability of grain from the region to feed the global population. Still 25 million tons of grain and oil seeds left in Ukraine. That's the third of last year's harvest. So we, we already have a huge logistical problem. Huizinga moved to Ukraine 20 years ago and manages 37,000 acres of farm ground. The stocks of last year's crop still in storage will soon be in the way of this summer's harvest. The main logistical bottleneck is the closed port at Odessa. While the city remains under Ukrainian control, the Russian Navy continues to limit shipping in the Black Sea to only Russian ports. The only option is to get the grain out of Ukraine is through the Black Sea ports. They have to be opened. That's the only option. The World Food Program is warning that an inability to distribute grain from the Black Sea region will lead to famine in dozens of countries, which could lead to political destabilization in multiple parts of the world. We have 49 million knocking on famine's door right now in 43 countries. I could tell you which 43 countries very well will have famine, destabilization, and mass migration. There's only one solution to getting the food, the grains, out of Ukraine. It's the ports, the ports in the Odessa region. They grow enough food to feed 400 million people. That's off the market. And the only way you get it back into the market is though, are the ports have to be opened back. For Market to Market, I'm Peter Tubbs. The drought monitor improved just over a point as heavy rains in some drought-plagued regions offered some respite this week. The relief may be temporary, but other times heavy rains will lead to flooding. The impacts of high water often extend long after floodwaters recede. In another installment of Iowa's Wild Weather, which can now be seen at iowapbs.org, John Torpy looks at the long tail of flooding. His report is our cover story. The floods of 2019 had a wide footprint across the Midwest and caused over $12 billion in damages between March 14th and March 31st. For Hamburg, the town spent a million dollars on the first day of the flood, money the town didn't have. Now we were broke. We had, we, we had, we had to, we needed money. And um, that's what we started doing the very day of the flood. After we gathered our stuff up in City Hall and moved to the um, elementary school, I started, I started raising money, private funds, because I knew we were going to need probably $20 million to rebuild because of 18 foot of water. So far, we've done um, $18.6 million, and uh, I've got another 20 to 25 that I'm asking for. The recovery process was slow going for Hamburg and surrounding communities. Floodwaters refused to leave farm fields. Two more flood events occurred through the spring and summer of that year. Some farmers reported having standing water in their fields as late as September. The 2019 crop for many in the area was non-existent. But I have to tell you, we first had to get over our tears because for us, it's still emotional. For us, we lost so much. And, um, you know, people were losing their homes and their businesses, but we were losing our town. And um, we had to get over that and suck it up the best we could during the day. We could cry early in the morning, we could cry at night, but suck it up and use it and do everything we can to help rebuild the town. 2019 floodwaters took a lot from Hamburg. 73 homes were ruined. Only six of the city's 44 businesses were able to open the day of the flood. Located next to Interstate 29, as well as being situated along a major railroad line, 
Hamburg has become an attractive town for agricultural businesses like Manildra Milling Corporation, Bartlett Grain Company, and AgriVision Equipment Group. It's tough to recover from, from something like this, not only as a Tim Maher is manager for AgriVision Equipment Group in Hamburg and says when the floodwaters destroyed most of the downtown businesses and inundated nearby farm fields, many of the area farmers found themselves in a different role. Some of them were able to take some of their equipment and actually help with some of the rebuild out on the levee. So they were able to, to go back out and put some of their equipment to work and, and get a little bit of income off of that. We had to change our business because we went from supporting farmers to supporting more of a construction-based business at that time. And a lot of our same customers, but, but they, they switched from being more farming ec economics to, to more of a construction-based business. And it, it really changed the way that we did business on a day-to-day. When the floodwaters finally receded, the people of Hamburg began to rebuild. With help from numerous state, local, and federal agencies, the town began to take on its former shape. But navigating the recovery process brought its own set of challenges. Economic development, homeland security, the governor's office, without them, we would not be where we are now because we're just so little with, with no staff. and to have staff that knows what to do in a disaster, we've got that. But to have staff that knows what to do after it, hey, I didn't even know what to do after it. I mean, you have to figure it out. That's what you have to do, because every disaster is different. The first step for rebuilding from the 2019 flood events was to stop the water from doing any more damage to the levees. The Army Corps of Engineers began work along the banks of the Missouri River with help from area residents. When you are a local landowner on any of the boards, you know, you have a little bit of skin in the game, which means it's not just uh, I'm just an elected official that represents not only myself, but I, I represent all my neighbors here too. And with that... Um, John Eskew is a farmer in Thurman, Iowa. He is also a trustee on the boards of the Pleasant Valley Levee District and a trustee for the Missouri Valley Drainage District. Both districts cover 34,000 acres from Thurman to Hamburg. When, when we, we had the catastrophic, catastrophic event, we, we see the, the levees fall. I mean, our, our job before that was mostly just watching, maintaining, communicating with our local officials and communicating with the uh, Army Corps of Engineers of how things are holding up. After that, it is, it is just a it's like getting a fire hose in the face. It's just, boom, what do we do now? A strong working relationship between the local levy sponsors, trustees, and the Army Corps of Engineers was key to getting work started on levy repair. So without the levy boards, the local levy districts, maintaining these to the core standards, the federal dollars can't come in and fix this. The sponsors, have to give us all the materials to fix the levy. We provide the labor. They just have to say, okay, here's the borrow source, go here, get it. And it's on them to work that deal out. The minute from there, I grab it, bring it down here and do what I need to do. The Army Corps of Engineers needed thousands of yards of material to rebuild the levees. During the flood, the Missouri River deposited tons of sand on farm fields in the area. As a levy sponsor, Askew found a way to help the Army Corps of Engineers and his neighbors at the same time. Through John's help, getting easements, we got into farm fields, scraped the sand off, built our core, and then we had to go find clay to cap it with. That was also John found us the clay. And so then we capped it with clay, put our rock on, and we're good. So it actually ends up being a win-win for the farmers. One, they got their fields cleaned up, of all the sand, and two, I put in the levee, so it helped me. For Market to Market, I'm John Torpy. Next, the Market to Market Report. Geopolitical developments influence domestic movement in the trade for the week. The nearby wheat contract shed 11 cents, while July corn lost two cents. Thursday's action of a possible hedge fund liquidation overshadowed delayed planting in the Northwest Plains region. 
in the soy complex. The nearby contract improved 27 cents. July meal added 240 per ton. July cotton decreased 285 per hundred weight. Over in the dairy parlor, June class three milk futures expanded nine cents. The livestock sector was higher. August cattle put on 85 cents. August feeders increased 240 and the July lean hog contract enlarged by 273. In the currency markets, U.S. dollar index declined by 147 ticks. July crude oil strengthened 448 per barrel. Comex Gold added 870 per ounce, and the Goldman Sachs Commodity Index improved almost 24 points to finish at 789.80. Joining us now to provide insight, our old friend Don Rose. Hey, Don. Great to be back, Paul. Good to have you here as we head into this holiday weekend, and there was always this standard of we have all these positions in place to hold us till Monday night's trade. In the wheat markets, let's start there. Is the bottom in? Well, you know, it's a volatile market, Paul, and I tell you, this thing is moving very fast, and you really have to be fast on your feet and knowledgeable with the technicals because we move, you hit some technical points with some of the fun buying, and you move into overbought and oversold levels just very fast. So is the bottom in. I think what this market's about is trying to sort out what the uh, risk management is in the market as we're trying to figure out what the world supply is. And you, you alluded to it in the uh, program uh, that are we moving into a food crisis? I, it seems like in the wheat we have one problem after another. If it's not the Russian Ukraine, it's the uh, Indian problem. Um, so yeah, a lot of issues on the table. And it is geopolitical. We have Russia uh, making contact with Brazil or I'm sorry, China making contact with Brazil, which impacts Russia, which impacts India, which imp everything is tied together. So how does the American producer sort this out? You, you talk about trying to sort the risk. How do they protect themselves right now? Well, I think you have to watch the technicals and then be careful of the noise because these things move uh, you know, very fast. So I think how a producer, what's he do? And I think that's both for the end user and the producer themselves. Uh, the producer, make sure you protect the bottom line. Uh, when you add some break-even levels, then look at programs that you can use uh, r uh, from risk management. If you uh, uh, just want to stay away from margin exposure, use some different tools. But and for the end user, I think you have to make sure and guard the crush because you know these are historically big prices, Paul. And we've had some other uh, times where we had some black swans and the markets just fall out of bed. Now, right now, I can tell you the trade is positive, wants to be positive, thinks that the world supplies are uh, impossibly tight. We keep running into one problem after another. If it's not our spring planning, it's the uh, uh, dryness in India with wheat. If it's the dryness in Europe, um, and we still are trying to deal with, are we going to ship grain out of uh, the Ukraine when their uh, their storage is uh, is full and they're going into harvest? So I mean, there's those type of issues that uh, you know we got to unlock uh, Ukraine supply somehow, and I think that's going to be probably next week's trade and then the weather trade. Well, the weather has been a story in corn. Uh, we moved ahead of ex or the five-year average on Monday's report of where we were for planting progress. We're still seeing this wet locked in, though, in North Dakota, South Dakota, Minnesota. They've been planting a whole lot more corn. What does it mean when they're not planting corn? Well, just think about it. I mean, these markets are always about weather. You know, I always say 80% of it's weather either here in the U.S. or around the world. And think about it last year. They were in a drought and we didn't know what was going to happen. And so now we flip to it's too wet. But I think what you have to say is now we still have in play what are the acres going to be? Are we going to get some prevent plant acres? Um, you know, are we going to see acres switched? So this June 30th report, I think, uh, on acres is going to be a big deal. But um, I think the trade is still trying to say that we're going to have uh, you know one to two million more corn acres regardless going to plant just what the yield is and we're probably going to see if we have uh, maybe one to two million less soybean acres but we'll see Paul and then we also have to get a yield well okay you, you gave me a number because I was just about to say what are you hearing I mean are, because there's always that head fake I mean it happens around the reports it happens around of oh I'm going to plant this no I'm going to plant this no I'm secretly going to plant this are there really big switch decisions happening right now? I don't think they're big switch. I mean, you know, basically there's um, 180 million acres of uh, corn beans in the rotation. I think we try and push those around. Um, with the prices where we're at, we're gonna try and plant those. Um, you know, the prevent plant uh, that we have, uh, you know, you can still take prevent plant and then uh, get 55% of your APH 
plant to a, a forage type of crop and then you can even decide whether you want to uh, actually take that uh, in plant or if you want to pay back the uh, the insurance so I mean it's there's just a lot of things that are in play here but it's uh, it's going to be a volatile market and I next week I think you'll start the weather watch we'll be talking about you know what's going to happen with the weather I think we're kind of starting to say that listen I know we've got the northern plains but I think we're kind of saying that the crop is basically sort of kind of planted now what's it look like on emergence and you know how's it going to go forward well and that's what we have coming out on Tuesday it'll be delayed next week we get I think our first look at crop conditions and I just made a drive down to St. Louis and everything looked good in there and there was some water uh, they had moisture what's that doing to the bean crop because I saw beans in the field too their their numbers gonna go up I, for sure come Tuesday what's the bean trade well, I think when you look at the end of the week, I mean, the soybeans, hard to believe that they're just off a of contract highs. We want just a few cents of it. So Monday, uh, Tuesday is probably going to be, you know, what does, can we push through those new highs or not? And, uh, you know, what's uh, China, are they still underneath the market buying soybeans? But we're overbought. We're kind of at the top end of the range, Paul. And what we've had so far is every time you get this market in a run, um, if you're chasing rallies and chasing breaks, it hasn't been real successful. So, you know, you try and use those uh, tools around things to keep yourself managed. Well, Thursday was a huge pop in soybeans and then kind of came back to just a standard under a dime range trade. Are those high days done? No, I don't think so. I think the, you know, those wild days, the big swinging markets, I think the producer has to prepare himself because I think those days are ahead of us. I mean, because we, we do have very tight world supplies and, you know, we were counting on South America to bridge the gap. Then we were counting on the Black Sea. We know what happened there counting on Europe and we know they're dry. We're counting on India, they turn dry. Now we're counting on North America. Well, it's wet in Canada and we've got issues here that aren't perfect. So, you know what I mean? We just can't buy a break. Uh, and what we see in the marketplace talking about breaks is the end user, every time we get down to support, get a little oversold, boom, they pop up, support the market again. Now we know as we move in deeper into the season, this risk management tries to come out of the market a little bit. Well, 1732 is what we closed on the July contract. Is, is 18 done? Is that, well, is I, that a possibility? Yeah, I think that's probably, you know, we shoot for these big round numbers. You know, if you can pop through this, uh, uh, make new highs, and you'll get, uh, you know, remember everybody that would be short has a loss, and then the scramble's on and 18. And then, but what we've had, Paul, is people, uh, the end user does not want to chase the market, but basis levels uh, very tight on corn and soybeans. The producers basically sold out except for his gambling bushels, and, uh, you know, the uh, supply starts in August again on soybeans here. Let it ride is what it sounds like many are doing. Let's move to livestock quickly here. Cattle market, uh, again, you mentioned the rain in Texas and Kansas. It's going to be too little too late for some of the pastures immediately, but what's that do long term for the cattle market? Well, the cattle market's been a disappointment for the bulls and for the cattle industry because we really never did get the big run during the grilling season. It was a tough grilling season. We didn't get the run, um, you know, to the upside on the demand uh, for whatever reason during Memorial Day, uh, Mother's Day. So I think it's a market now, Paul, you're going through. You're going to have bigger numbers through the summer. Um, you know, the demand is shaky. Exports are good, but the domestic demand is a little bit shaky. Um, so the placement figures that we had on last cattle on feed report kicked the bull story down the road again, probably into the middle of the uh, fourth quarter. So that's the cattle market. You know, we're, we keep grasping for the the, uh, we've had four years of liquidation and the trade keeps looking for two to three years of a bull market and it's just when. Is it time to expand a herd? Am I going to buy some feeders this next week? Well, I tell you one thing. If, if you I can find them. If you look at it from a cycle standpoint, we usually run three and a half years up, three and a half years down. So, you know, we're poised for a bull market. It's not going to be the supply side. It's gonna, if we stumble, it's going to be because of the demand side. Interest rates are rising. Consumer spending is slowing. Uh, they're getting more selective. They're buying down on their protein needs. Uh, so it's not necessarily a one-way bull, bull market. So use risk management there, too. All right, demand for beef, maybe not as strong. What about the demand for pork? We know demand for poultry is high. What about for pork? 
Yeah, you talk about poultry, uh, chicken breast, I think, are at an all-time high here. They surpassed 2014, so even chicken. But your question's about the pork, and, you know, the pork, uh, you know, the disease issues pushed us to the upside. Uh, export demand just continues to flag. It's just the opposite of the beef. So our domestic demand has to pick up the pace, and the domestic demand, um, you know, a little bit concerned of. You know, from a risk management standpoint, we're seeing people, if you can get some rallies, uh, 2 to $4, risk management makes sense. Uh, probably going to expand the herd, uh, breeding herd 1%, maybe more in June. So uh, this liquidation phase, lack of expansion, may be coming to an end mm. on the hogs. All right. And guess what else is coming to the end? Our time. Thank you, John Rose. Good to see you. Thank you, Paul. All right, we'll continue this discussion in Market Plus. We have a whole lot of questions that we're going to answer from you. As I said, we'll answer them in Market Plus, so join us. You can find that free on our website of markettomarket.org. And information comes from all different sources, and we've compiled many of the stories that we are reading into a Flipboard magazine called Market to Market Reading Material. Click on the red and white F on the homepage of markettomarket.org. Next week. We look at the shakeup of a niche market. Thank you so much for watching. Have a great week. Market to Market is a production of Iowa PBS, which is solely responsible for its content. What's the most complex industry on Earth? It's not genetics, or meteorology, or logistics. It's a business that involves them all. It's farming. Thank you, farmers, from Pioneer. Tomorrow, for over 100 years, we've worked to help our customers be ready for tomorrow. Trust in tomorrow. Information is available from a Grinnell Mutual agent today.